I'm really delighted to be here today. I'm a verbatim storyteller, which means that I use the words of real people to tell their own stories. These words can be live, I can interview them about their experiences and transcribe that to form a piece of theatre. Or maybe these words might have been recorded previously, such as in letters, diaries, journals. Occasionally, to give a piece structure and context, I might use news headlines. I've used tweets, I've used comments on online forums, extracts from public inquiries, or extracts from court transcripts. The reason I love using verbatim theatre to tell real people's stories is because it's real, it's powerful. It gives communities a voice that might not have one, and best of all, it can grow and change as events themselves change. I'd like to tell you today about the two communities that I worked with. They're very different. One is a working class community in Hoxton, North London, whose lives were changed forever in the aftermath of a street fight in one dark autumn. The second community is the LGBT community in Russia, just before the Sochi Olympics. My first story, therefore, is about Sam Hallam. In 2004, he was arrested and charged with the murder he didn't commit. There had been a street fight between two rival groups of teenagers, and in the ensuing scuffle, a young trainee chef called Asaius Kasahun was stabbed and very tragically killed. Sam and one other defendant were arrested and charged with his murder. The problem was that Sam hadn't actually been at the fight. But there were two witnesses against him who said he was there. They placed him at the scene holding a weapon. Sam didn't have an alibi for the night in question, so you might think this is an open and shut case. Well, the jury definitely thought that. After his conviction, some of the media demonized Sam, calling him a hoodie, this was the height of hoodie mania, uh, they alleged he was a violent and a powerful gang leader. But Sam's mother, Wendy, and the Hoxton community came from, knew this wasn't true. They formed a campaign to free him. Here they all are outside uh, the court. What they wanted to do was show the courts about their Sam. The Sam who played football, hung around with his mates, did carpentry with his dad. He wasn't a violent and powerful gang leader. But more importantly, when they looked at the witness statements that incriminated Sam, they saw that the two witnesses had changed their statements over the course of the investigation. One of them had then gone back on his statement in court, saying, I don't want to lie in court now. That is no evidence to, connect, to convict someone of murder. But the judge didn't listen to their appeal. For the group of Hoxton fathers, mothers, and friends of Sam's, the powers that be had simply put Sam in jail for 12 years and thrown away the key. But Sam's community weren't going to give up that easily. They didn't have a higher education, they didn't have the funds for uh, an expensive legal defense. But what they did have was heart, and a lot of it. Together, they formed a campaign to free him, run out of the local community hall. They engaged the activist Paul May, who'd recently worked on uh, the Birmingham Six case, and asked him for advice. Paul knew that it was essential to keep Sam's case in the public eye, in order for it to, to stand a chance of being referred back to the Court of Appeal. So with his help, they started to organize community events, such as a sponsored parachute jump. There was also a sponsored football match. Um, on Sam's birthday, they drove a red bus to the gates of the prison, and they opened a stall with literature on the case that highlighted the flaws of the conviction at every community fair in London. So this is where we came in. My husband, David Mercatali, is a theater director. He's read about Sam's case online through the website that Paul had set up. We couldn't believe that someone had been convicted on such slender evidence. Two witnesses who then changed their stories, one of whom went back on that statement in court. 
we wanted to use our skills in theatre to help um, highlight the flaws in the case against him. So we created a theatre piece called Someone to Blame. We chose the title Someone to Blame because the chief prosecution witness, when asked why she uh, had accused Sam, said in court, I was just looking for someone to blame. We thought that verbatim theatre was ideal to tell Sam's story. We wanted the community and Sam himself to get a chance to put their side of the story. So David interviewed the young people who had been at the fight, all of whom said that Sam wasn't there. Whilst I looked my way through a stack of legal papers, uh, witness statements, police interviews, court transcripts, and whittled it all down to create scenes for a 90-minute play. Sam's mother, Wendy, found a box of Sam's letters who'd been sent her from prison, so we used extracts from those too. Because this was a live legal case, we had to make really sure that everything we said could be justified. We wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't fall foul of any of the laws such as contempt of court, copyright, um, defamation or libel. So we made sure that everything was indexed and footnoted. I think our footnotes went into the hundreds. And of course, in using that text, we had to edit it down, otherwise we'd have a play that lasted eight years. But we made real sure that that editing didn't change the sense of uh, what anybody said, or by inference or juxtaposition, uh, distort the truth of the statements. So this process probably took about three years, and the play itself went through about 20 drafts. As Sam's case progressed through the appeal system, the play itself could change to keep pace with it. Sam's case was referred to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which is a body that examines uh, convicted defendants to see if there's uh, flaws in the case against them, and then if they choose, refer them back to the court. The CCRC ordered an independent police inquiry, and the police inquiry examined the original investigation, and what they found was quite chilling. The Sam, whose name was first mentioned in connection with the fight, was another Sam entirely. Different surname, different address. And yet this had been wiped from the files. Secondly, there was evidence on his mobile phone that he had been somewhere else during that time. But that evidence had also been taken out of the original investigation, which could have pointed to his innocence instead of his guilt. The King's Head Theatre in London uh, decided to back Sam's case when David spoke to them. They offered to produce the show for a four-week run, which was pretty incredible. And on opening night, the audience was full of Sam's friends, his family, some of the people who'd been at the original fight, even one of the original defence counsel. Uh, the play was featured on TV, um, at London Tonight, and uh, l many of the local newspapers all backed the case. And we were even told that afterwards, some representatives from the Crown Prosecution Service had come to see it as well. Six weeks after the play finished, Sam's case went back to the Court of Appeal. Thanks to the police inquiry, there was now enough evidence to re-examine his conviction. We all piled in. There was, um, quite apart from the campaign members and his family and friends, all the theatre people came too. We had actors, uh, lighting designers, producers, everybody just crammed into the gallery. We were sitting on each other's knees. And after three hours of hearing the evidence, the chief prosecution barrister stood up and said that they weren't going to contest Sam's appeal. In short, they were throwing in the towel. And then there was a huge cheer, and everybody just leapt to their, their feet, and the people were kissing and hugging and cheering, and the judge had to shout to make herself heard. And Sam walked free through the doors of the Court of Appeal and was drenched in champagne by his friends. Still gives me shivers to think about that moment, that after seven years in jail for a murder he did not commit, he could walk free. And so a few weeks later, to celebrate his release, we did a gala performance of Someone to Blame, and this time we added in the new and very happy ending. 
My next story, then, it concerns a community, and it takes place hundreds of miles further east. In the summer of 2013, President Putin uh, passed a law on a federal level across Russia, which prohibited the promotion of non-traditional lifestyles to children. Non-traditional is pretty much uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. And by promoting, this could, uh, this could cover a wide variety of things, such as uh, advocating for gay equality, gay rights parades, uh, being a teacher teaching children who is outwardly known to be gay, or giving a positive spin on homosexuality, according to them. Of course, you may remember all the furore in the build-up to the Olympics. Uh, there was pictures of Russians being beaten during uh, gay pride parades by anti-gay mobsters. Moscow Pride was closed down and banned for 100 years. Uh, the, the whole international outcry was that an event such as the Olympics, which is meant to celebrate diversity and achievement, is being hosted by a country with such backward laws. So the King's Head Theatre, who had produced Someone to Blame, Sam's story, commissioned me to create another verbatim piece. This time, it was to be based on the lives of young LGBT Russians. The idea was to give them a voice on stage that was being denied them in their own country. Trouble was, I was eight months pregnant at the time, so I couldn't really jump on a plane to St. Petersburg. So this time, I talked to people using Skype, on the phone, by email, sometimes I used questionnaires, or in very rare cases, I interviewed people such as in this rally outside the Russian embassy. All in all, though, this project was very different. For one thing, I only had three weeks to produce a first draft rather than three years. Secondly, it wasn't as easy as interviewing the Hoxton community. Quite apart from the language barrier or the distance, there was something else. It was more a psychological barrier. Um, they'd been raised in a culture that equates homosexuality with bestiality and paedophilia, and so a lot of them found it really hard to say the word gay. There also wasn't just one story, as there had been with Sam. Uh, this time we had lots of different voices, lots of people telling their stories. There was a man who was lured on an internet date, only to be beaten up in the park. A uh, gay mother had to uh, escape Russia for fear of losing her children. An activist had to flee to New York after falling foul of the local police chief. A teacher lost his job after being outed as gay. So the play was now more of a Tolstoyan epic, of a whole sweep of Russian society. And uh, most of the play would recreate these experiences on stage for people to see. After the first draft was complete, and here's Putin as you've never seen him. After the first draft was complete, we staged a couple of public readings of the play. It captured a lot of media interest, it was topical, and the idea was that any profits made from the play would go to help gay rights groups in Russia. But after the readings, word was just spreading, and I started getting contacted by producers all over the world. And they were from, they were from the States, New York, Denver, Los Angeles, the people from Europe, Holland, Germany, uh, China, um, Japan. Honestly, there were so many people trying to say, what can we do? How can we get involved? So the King's Head Theatre decided to license uh, the play so that small independent um, productions or readings could take place on the proviso that any profits raised went to help gay advocacy groups in Russia. This was community gone global. So this is the Edinburgh version of the play here. And in New York, they had a gala production and even used some of the real-life contributors who'd moved to New York because of the anti-gay laws, playing themselves on stage alongside some of the um, professional actors from Orange is the New Black, as you may see Crazy Eyes in the middle there, which, if you're a fan, I thought was pretty cool. In London, then, the play opened just before the Sochi Olympics. Because verbatim theatre can mirror events and grow and change, the idea was to update the play as events happened. And we uh, started with a mock Olympic ceremony, but uh, thanks to the Russian laws and the International Olympic Committee's uh, bylaws themselves, 
Almost nobody spoke out, politicians or athletes, either for fear of falling foul of the laws or maybe for losing their medal entitlement. Large corporations who backed the games, Coca-Cola especially, didn't speak out in a disgraceful show of appeasement. And, uh, but there were a couple of protests. Uh, a couple, um, about 15 activists protested in Red Square and were immediately arrested. And there was a single protest in Sochi. So we put those in the play. And when the play closed and the Sochi Olympics went home, all profits from the play, wherever it had been conformed, went to benefit gay rights groups in Russia. Two communities then, one local, the other international, made their voices heard through verbatim theater and challenged the structures of the great. Someone to blame showed the UK court system that uh, the community would not take it lying down. They showed them that there was enough evidence to release Sam. After the Olympics, the IOC itself changed its charter to specifically forbid discrimination on, on grounds of uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Of course, that's not really enough, but it's a start. Going forwards, and I'm not including the next two bidding cities on this, going forward, any host cities should have to prove that they do not actively discriminate against gay people because they have to abide by the charter. See, for me, this shows the real power of the Baton Theatre. It can address social issues. It can give communities a voice. Small events can start out and in a ripple effect, they become global and international. For me, this is what verbatim theatre can do. This is what we, as a community, as a people, can do. Thank you. <laughs>